I'm a bit freaked out because there's so many people here and I have a bit of a confession to make. I kind of got you all here under false pretenses because much and all that I would love to, I can't teach you how to control change. <laughs> no one can. <laughs> I know you can go if you want to, that's okay. But no one can. And before Caroline starts freaking out about her P45 run thing, I promise I can. There are things that we can do. But change impacts us from the very second that we're conceived. And most of the time, we wouldn't notice it then, but most of the time, we don't even notice it. We are a child until one day we're an adult. We're young until one day we're not fit for coppers anymore. <laughs> we're a newbie in a place like this until one day we're the person showing people around. We're a high-flying executive flying all around the world until one day we're claiming a pension. We're sick until one day we're healthy, as anyone who's had the flu recently knows all about. And equally, we're perfectly healthy, living our normal lives, until one day we get a diagnosis that changes it all. And like I said, most of the time, we're happy enough because we've created this idea that normality is no change. We don't notice the single gray hair appearing. We don't notice those small little bits and bobs. And then something powerful, something unexpected, something unwanted happens, and it changes all that. And we realize that normality isn't all of these changes. Normality is, is, is change. Normality is all of that thing. I just want to show you. I, I talk too much, but actually it might be easier just to show you guys. If you close your eyes for a second and find your pulse, for anybody who doesn't know where the pulse is, it's in your neck or in your wrist or in your heart, but, but find it, and I can assure you it's definitely there. As you feel it, close your eyes and see in your mind's eye the graph that it's making, the ups and downs, ups and downs. And if you're on this side of the audience, guaranteed it's going an awful lot faster than normal. But then just take your hand away for a split second and continue to see that graph and just see it fading out, see it those ups and downs smoothing out. It's all normal, it's all calm, it's all controlled. But there's not much life going on there. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what I can help you with. Because normality isn't a place that we all run to when we try to get back to normal after a big change happens. Normality is, includes all of that change. Normality is where we have to take those changes. We have to do something with them. You cannot avoid them. There is no such thing as going back to normal. You take it all with you. And I've just realized, because I'm thinking about my own heart rate, that I've forgotten the lovely images that go with that. But what I want to show you is that, and does anybody recognize this quote? And anyone who does is kind of going, I'm not admitting that I recognize that. It's, uh, yeah, I know, I'm giving up all my secrets here, but it's uh, from Harry Potter, that well-known <laughs> well <laughs> point of reference. But it's so true. No matter what happens, there is always something that you can do, always, no matter what it is. And it's all about taking that bit of control, reaching out and turning on the light, no matter how awful your experiences and your changes may make you feel. So, I know it's not normal to open your laptops and things like that here, but what I'd like us to do, rather than just you guys sit back and listen to me, I'd like us to use this as an opportunity to create solutions for whatever changes are going on in your own life. The first part of that is naming it, naming that darkness. So if you'd like to open your laptops or a piece of paper if you have it, or your phone, and write down something that you're dealing with right now. You can write down a, a code name. If you haven't any paper with you, if you can just think about that and bear that in mind as we go through the exercises. 
Because what happens when we are faced with this change is we lose sight of the fact that life is change and we lose sight of the fact that, that this is what it's all about. And when that happens, we, we, we f get that feeling of out of control and we, we crave for that sense of normality. And to give you an idea of why I talk about things like that, I suppose I'd better introduce myself a little bit. Five years ago, I was worried. I had just had a little baby. I was on maternity leave. And I was worried about going back to work. How would I be perceived at work? What had happened with the team while I was away? Maybe I'd be overlooked now for promotion prospects because I couldn't commit in the same way as I could, I had done earlier. I was worried about the commute up and down and the crash runs and leaving at five o'clock, thinking, God, maybe people think I'm on a half day when I leave at five o'clock. And then I got a diagnosis of aggressive breast cancer. And I wasn't so worried about the commute then at that stage. So what you can do in those situations, you freak out as you do, you cry as you do, but then there's no way out but through it. You get on with the treatment, you do what you're told, you kind of give up those choices and that control and that's part of it. And you have to do that because there is only one way out and that's through it. But I'm here today not in spite of all those changes and things that happened to me, but I'm here because of it. I couldn't have stood in front of you guys five years ago. I just couldn't have done it. Probably wouldn't have had anything to talk about, but that's beside the point. But we're, I suppose I just want to impress upon you that guys, that we, we, we run away a lot. We avoid a lot when we're faced with scary changes with traumatic changes because those changes can range from being mild anxiety if you're worrying about asking someone out on a date or asking for a raise to intense trauma when you're dealing with bereavement or a life-changing diagnosis or anything scary I mean, however you experience it is totally normal that's the way you're supposed to experience it but trying to run away from it trying to find this normality that doesn't work and especially, I don't know, I'm sure you guys have come across it where something has happened and it's all over and then people say, ah, great, you can go back to normal now. The thing is, I couldn't go back to my pre-cancer me any more than I could go back to my pre-motherhood me. I just couldn't. It's not possible. So when you see things like human, evolve in, human evolvement even, is that the right word? Charles Darwin had it right and he said the survival of the fittest. We're not all walking around on all fours anymore. We let go what we needed to let go of. We took with us what we needed to take with us. And we changed to make it so that we can now walk on two feet. Our whole skeleton has changed. And that's the point of today's talk. Because we can always do three things. The first, we choose we choose what's important to us. The second, we change. We change our perspective, we change our position. And the third is we control the actions we take. If you use all of those three steps, no matter what whirlwind picks you up and pushes you in a completely different place, no matter how change impacts you, you can get on with it. And not only can you get on with it, you can become who you need to be and you can evolve. So the first step is getting clear then on where we want to go after these whirlwinds. And I, it's, it's ironic that I'm here today because anyone who knows me knows that quite literally the best thing that ever happened in my life was Google Maps. I know it's, <laughs> it's ridiculous, but it literally got me here today. Because not only, no, you're jungle, it's, it's unreal. No matter how often, no matter, I've forgotten what I was going to say there now because I'm kind of thinking, where did I pack my car? Really? I am, I am bad at that. 
But oh yes, of course, the best thing about it, the thing I love about it is that not only does it tell you where you need to go and how you want to get there, it tells you where you are and the direction you're facing it. It's incredible. And when I went through my own thing that we all have, when I, when I went through my own whirlwind, I was totally lost. I, I wasn't the person I had been before that. And that frightened the life out of me. And then I realized that every single one of us has our own internal GPS system. And we can call that fulfillment or meaning or values or whatever you want to call it. But what it boils down to is this. It's what is important to you. That's it. If you know what's important to you and you know that and really know it, then every decision you take, every step you take is done with that in mind. And it makes life so much easier. Because wherever that whirlwind drops you, you can find out where you want to go, where you are, and the direction you're facing. It still doesn't help you with where you park the car, but that's by the by. So what I'd like you to do is close your eyes for a second. We'll do a little exercise, if everyone's OK with that. And at the end of it, hopefully you get a real sense of, a little sense of what's important to you. So close your eyes, please. And if I can ask you to take a deep breath in and out. Deep breath in and breathe out fully. Deep breath in and breathe all the way out. Now you will notice the sounds in the room, but as you hear my voice, you become more and more relaxed. You can feel the weight of the chair supporting you if you're lucky enough to have a chair. And for those of you who are standing, hold on. <laughs> but you become more and more relaxed. You are calm, safe, and relaxed. In and out. Now, I want you to imagine that you have just been given one week to live. Just seven days. You feel the shock of hearing that, the horror of having to tell everybody you love. This is your last Friday. But you also begin to notice that you have the freedom to do exactly what you want. These are your seven days. These are your last seven days. You can choose what you want to do. What is important that you do? What is important that you say? What message do you want to leave? What do you want to do with the people you are going to choose to spend the time with? What is important that those people remember about you? What would you be brave enough to do that you're not already doing? Or perhaps what would you stop doing that you're currently spending too much time at? Now I want you to think about that challenge that you wrote down. If you had seven days to live, what would you do about it? What's important about that? In a moment, I'm going to ask you to open your eyes and just record down one thing that you can do about your challenge now that you know what's important to you. Take a deep breath in and out. And when you're ready, open your eyes. If you can make a note of those things, any thoughts that you have about what's important to you. Maybe something you didn't realize you're spending too much time at. So what we've done there is change your perspective a little bit. And actually, that's the second part. Because we don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. And we are all safe and secure in our lovely little comfort zone. And for as long as we stay in that comfort zone, we can only see the things the way we've always seen them. 
So when you try, try to challenge those boundaries and push out the, the, the edges of that comfort zone a little bit, you start to understand that there are other solutions, other ways of thinking about things. And that can help you get solutions to the problems that you're facing, no matter what that is. So it's very definitely easier to blame whatever it is and be a victim of the situation. But actually, our responsibility is to ourselves to keep that line going up and down on our heart rate. We have to step up. You have to move out of the place of being a victim. And one of the ways we can do that is to change our perspective and get a different insight, a different way of thinking about things. So what I'd like to do is everyone, if you can just bring to mind your most positive relationship, somebody that you look up to, somebody whose advice you, you take on and you actually hear rather than just listen to. And have a think about it and imagine what they would do if they were faced with your challenge. What would they do if they were faced with what, you were, what you're looking at, what you're worrying about right now? What would they suggest you do? If something comes to mind, make a quick note of that. Now, I'd like everyone to stand up, please. <laughs> and I'd like you to pick somebody else in the room and swap places with them. Have a look at them as you're... <laughs> Have a look at them and swap faces. <laughs> now, all right, guys. As you take their place and as you sit down. As you sit down in their place, I'd like you to look at that person and imagine that you're now wiggling your toes in their shoes, if you can stand to imagine that. They might be a different gender, a different culture. They might see things a different way. They might be a different managerial level than you. But guaranteed, one thing's for certain is that they can see things differently than you. How would they deal with your challenge? What would they do if they were faced with the thing you're worried about? Have a think about that for a second and see if you can come up with one solution that you wouldn't have thought about when you're standing in your own shoes. Do you get a fresh insight from that perspective? You can always go and stand on the top of Everest. You can always, well, maybe you can't, but you can, there are all the astronauts who, who've left this world have come back with a fresh perspective and have changed their whole lives as a result because they've seen things from a different different place. That's what you guys are doing here. So look at the person whose space you've just taken and find out and challenge yourself to think of one thing that they would suggest they would do in your position. Okay, go back to your seats, go back to your places. <laughs> And as you sit down this time, as you sit down this time, I'd like you to age yourself 25 years. What would your older self say about your challenge? If you are 25 years older, you've already lived through your challenge. You've already asked that person out on a date. You've already asked for a raise. You've already dealt with the cancer or the, or the, the, the headaches, or you've already done your driving test. You've already managed to live through that change and you've evolved and changed as a result. What advice would your older self give about the thing, about the challenge that you're facing, the change that worries you right now? If there's anything that you can gain from that, please write it down. Or take a moment later to go through it when you have time to think about it. So like I said, this exercise creates lots of just positive relationships with yourself and it shows you that there is life outside your comfort zone. And it's a gentle way of doing it rather than having to actually sit in the consultant's chair and listen to that news. 
being pushed out of your comfort zone like that allows you to take responsibility for the situation and it allows you actually to gain control over the situation because you then are able to not only know what's important but you're seeing different ways and you're coming up with your own solutions to things. Solutions that aren't possible when you're dealing with the fight or flight response that change can often cause us. My third, third, third step um, for dealing with change is the whole notion of control. Because there is always, always something that you can do. The problem is we're not in a habit of thinking like that. Our brains are incredible. They are an incredible tool of efficiency. But if you've always thought the way you think, you'll always get what you've always gotten. And changing your perspective and choosing what's important are, are ways of challenging that. But no matter how much you do that, unless you're willing to step up, put on your big girl pants and get on with it, and take action, nothing will change. And you will continue to be a victim of that change rather than the driver of it. So what I would like you to do is to think of three things, write them down if you can, that you can do right now that will further your challenge, that will help you move through that challenge. And those things can be as simple as having a cup of tea so that you can get the the mental space to think about it. And we don't actually think about things in a positive light very often. We worry about things, we ruminate about things, but we don't actually think it through in the same way as that you would deal with a project or a spec out a, a new design. You, are, you only get one chance at this. It doesn't matter whether you have seven days to live or 70 years. But if you're not behind the driving wheel, it doesn't matter. You might as well be having one of those flat lines. So there's two principles to bear in mind with the whole area of control. The first, like I said, is that you can always do something. And I'll teach you the three small things that you can always, always do, a kind of an emotional first aid box, if you will. And the second thing is that action actually creates confidence. When we're faced with an unexpected change or an unwanted change, the first thing that happens is we're impacted. We feel we can do nothing. You feel that you're out of control, that everything is happening to you. And you have no confidence in your abilities to do anything. And a lot of the time, you don't have any ability to do anything. I certainly couldn't come up or, or dish out the chemo that I had to get. So in that respect, yes, you do give up a lot of control, a lot of, of um, choices in those situations. But the thing is, you haven't given up all control. You haven't given up all choices. And the more action you can take, in the same way as a journey has, starts with one step, the more action you can take, the more momentum you can build up, the easier the next step becomes, the next step, the next step. So if you're worrying about asking someone on a date or asking about a rise, Schedule a meeting or send a text. Do one small, tiny thing that gets the momentum going. So if you can think, I'm going to just give you a moment right now to think and write down three things that you can do as soon as you leave here that will further your change. But things that not only you can do, but things that you're committing to doing. If you can take a moment to write those down, please. This exercise is very, very good for, and the physical act of writing, actually, writing even more so than typing or jotting notes in your phone. The physical act of writing has been proven to be an action in itself and can allow you the space to get to the end of a thought. And if you can get to the end of a thought, you're eliminating the space that the worry can creep in. So the more and more you write, the better it is for your, for your ability to come up with those solutions.
So I promised you a few other things to add to your I can list. And the first requires a little bit of visualization, if you don't mind once more. Don't worry, you're not going to get a, a death sentence this time. But if you can sit with your bum to the back of your chairs, or sit as comfortably as you can be on the floor, I'd like you to put your feet solidly on the ground and wiggle your toes so that you can feel them connect to the ground. And feel your hands heavy in your lap. And close your eyes for a moment. I want you to breathe in deeply to the count of one, two, three, four, five. And out slowly, one, two, three, four, five. And breathe in again. And breathe out fully. Now, I'd like you to think about your very worst day at work. The worst day that ever happened to you at work. Remind yourself what you were wearing. Who was there with you? Remind yourself what you could smell. What was going on? What could you hear? What words were being said? Stay with that memory just for a moment and put yourself back in that position of your worst day at work. And as you remember that, I'd like you just to notice the thoughts that are coming up. Maybe they're the thoughts that happened on that day. Perhaps you were feeling you're not good enough. Perhaps you've been told you're not good enough. Perhaps you're feeling you're going to get caught out. Or that your work isn't as good as other people's. Perhaps you're noticing feelings of anger, of disappointment, shame perhaps, or maybe guilt or regret or fear. Are people blaming you? As you notice those thoughts and memories, I want you just to notice the reaction your physical reaction right now. Is your heart rate getting a little bit faster as you remember those feelings? Perhaps you're, you're reminding yourself of the knot in your stomach or the, the creak in your neck. Perhaps your breathing is a little bit shallower. This is your physiological response to the fear, to the anxiety. This is your fight or flight response. But with your eyes still closed, I'd like you to take your thumb and your index finger and rub them together ever so slowly, ever so lightly, so that you can feel the ridges of your fingerprints. Perhaps you've never even noticed that you can feel them before, but you can feel every ridge and every furrow on your fingerprints. Now using your thumb and your middle finger, do the same. How are they different? Is there a difference? What you'll notice right now is that as you do that, it's impossible to think the thoughts you were thinking earlier. As you concentrate on finding those lines, you realize you're not able to do the two things at once. <laughs> Just deal with this problem any minute. <laughs> this could easily be my worst day of work, but we get past that. <laughs> so, okay, everyone's got their eyes open again. <laughs> But what I just wanted to notice, hopefully, before you got interrupted by whatever that was, um, is that doing something like that, that fingertip mindfulness, if you like. Mindfulness is an incredible thing. It's great. I hate it. I'll be completely honest. It's like, oh, 
I like, I love the notion of it. I love the idea that I can be so calm and in control of my life. And the reality is, it's like, yeah, I do it once and then it'll be another week. And ah, sure, I'll do a bit of that. It doesn't work for me. And also, no matter how good, no matter how great you are at practicing mindfulness, when you're freaking out because your boss has just called you in to, to, to talk about a report, when you're worrying about something, when you're sitting in a consultant's chair and you're worrying about information, you, you can't pop off and do a bit of mindfulness. You just can't. So this is incredible. You can do it quietly. You can do it quickly. And it gives you the tiniest, tiniest little bit of space. That's all you need to put in place one of your icons. Because if you can do that, then your brain, what, what happens is that your brain is starting to open up those pathways that have been closed off to you. When the fight or flight response is triggered, what happens is you literally, literally cannot think. You can't think because all of your mind's resources are focused on the danger. And those parts of your brain that deal with the memories and the creative solutions and things like that, it, they're literally blocked by all the cortisol and adrenaline in your system. Doing this kind of bypasses the fight or flight response for a split second, and that's all you need. It gives you the space to think. So that is something that you definitely can always do. The next exercise, and I'm going to ask you to stand up, and I'm going to ask you to go with me on this one. And believe you me, it's better if all everybody's eyes are closed on this one because nobody comes out of this looking glam. What I'd like you to do is just drop down anything that you have in your hands. And for a count of 10, I want you to squeeze every single muscle you can as hard as you can, including your eyes, your bums, your thumbs, your legs, your toes, everything for 10 seconds. Go. One, two. I'm not seeing any eyes closed. Everyone do it. Three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And relax, shake it out. That was ridiculous. Do it again as hard, hard as you can. Three, two, one, go. Two, three, four, five. You can definitely do better than that. Nine, ten, and let it go. And we do it again. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten, and relax. You could definitely do better. Do it again. One, <laughs> two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, one last time. Go. One, <laughs> two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. Do you feel the difference in your muscles? If you've been given it all in that, you will feel and that allows you to turn off your fight or flight, blah, 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 the fight or flight response, no matter how ridiculous it seems. You can all sit down for a second. This is an incredible tool for insomnia. If you're, dealing with, if you're dealing with insomnia, which is driven as a result of anxiety, and you get that fizziness that goes on in your muscles, this is brilliant for that. If you do it about 12 times, you guaranteed you're too knackered to do anything but sleep. But you have to go all out. But equally, if you're, OK, I, I'll admit to being somebody who can get myself quite wound up. And once you're in that thought, you can't think of, you can't think of your way out. That busyness can be dealt with. Anybody who loves your boxing or physical exercise, go and do that. That's, that's what it's for. It allows you to get more relaxed and, and, and take advantage of that. But it's not always possible to go and do a spot of boxing or dancing or running. But you can always take yourself somewhere private, perhaps, <laughs> and, and do that. And that allows you to get rid of the adrenaline that built up in your muscles. And by doing that, it gives your body and the amygdala this, the, um, the signal that the danger has passed, rather than getting stuck in a vicious cycle of stress upon more stress upon more stress, which is what happens. The final thing that we can do, and we can always do, is, like I said, action creates confidence. 
So how about we get a little confidence hack? Something that will give you the confidence and fake it until you can make it. Now, most, I'm sure some of you have heard this before, but I'd like you to stand up for me and give me your inner superhero. If you put your feet hip distance apart and arms on your hips, you can close your eyes if you want to, but I'd like you just to think how incredible you look in Lycra. <laughs> how brilliant it is to have your own special superpower. What would your superpower be if you had one? If you had that superpower, how would you deal with your challenge? If you can keep your head up and your tummy tucked in and really, really feel that superpower. Feel how powerful you actually are. Probably better to do it without putting your underpants on the outside of your tights, but we go with whatever you need to on that. So this has been proven to increase your testosterone levels, but it's also been proven to decrease your cortisol levels, which is the very hormone that's blocking those pathways to the memory banks and experience banks of your brain during the fight or flight response. So when you do feel anxious about something, it's very easy for us to say, oh God, I couldn't do that, or I won't do that, or try and avoid it. If you can do something as simple as this for two minutes, you're allowing yourself to boost your feelings of confidence, but you're also allowing yourself to take that one action, to take that one step, to create that momentum. You can all sit down. And thank you for going for it for me. These things are only small tools, guys. I, like I said at the start, I can't help you control change. My God, I wish I could, because I wouldn't wish some of the experiences on anybody. Nobody wants to go through the horrible stuff that we go through in life. But we don't have a choice. Those horrible things are as equal a part of our lives as the gorgeous things and the lovely things. You don't get to have one without the other. So when we look at a problem or a challenge, we can often look at what we can't do. And that's kind of where we have a habit of that. And what I'd like just to do, even just in a small way, is to stop moving in the direction of reacting to change, but actually step forward into being the driver of change. I'm here today, like I said, not in spite of change, but because of it. I've created a new normal. I've created a life where I help people deal with emotional and mental difficulties. I, I, I'm here today not as a cancer survivor, but as a mommy, as a person, as somebody who's just living. I think this is a great quote because, to be honest, that's what the only way that we can control change. It's not about striving to avoid it, not about trying to stay going back to normal. It's about embracing it, building the new, choosing what you want, adapting however you need to, and going for it. So every single day we're impacted by change. None of us are going to change that. But like I said, we can change the victim or we can change the driver. We can drown or we can surf the waves. But it's our choice. Shine, thank you very much, and uh, good luck <laughs> then the rest of your day. I just have a few questions for yeah. you, and then we'll we have a few minutes then to move to audience Q and A. Just remember to wait until we get a microphone to you for the audience Q and A. We have one on either side so that they can hear you on the recording. So my first question is: these different skills and techniques that we can practice that that we've heard today, um, we can practice them when we're we're facing a challenge. How often? Do we have to relearn how we deal with change? Does it become that ev every time we face a change, we are, we're back at the beginning again in terms of our reaction and our responses? Or with time, do these techniques eventually become the, almost the automatic way that we turn to when, when facing challenge? So the answer is 
yes and no. So the reality is, is that we're great. A brain, like I said, is a, it's a master illusionist. And it allows us to believe that those ups and downs of everyday life aren't even happening. So we kind of form into the habit of doing things like that and, and kind of thinking of things in the same way. Tools like these are incredible, but it's actually the importance of them is only when the unexpected happens. And the unexpected, by its very nature, doesn't happen often enough for us to create habits about it. We can improve and we can definitely get better and you can get in the habit of this notion of being able to always do something. But actually when it comes down to it, when something unexpected or unwanted happens, you, your reactions are going to be the same. You, you can have your anxiety and your, your trauma depending on what you're facing, but, and that is part of life. You can't not have that. So yes, they can help, but they can only help in the aftermath of it happening. They can't help it not happen, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, okay, great. Uh, another question I want to ask you about is, in, in lots of work environments, and, and definitely in ours, we face a lot of change. Mm -hmm. Do you notice that people, people are more open or accepting or um, respond more positively to change in, in one area over the other, like their, their work life over their, their personal life? Or in general, do we, do we deal with them mostly the same? I think we deal with them mostly the same. It depends on the importance of them. So if you are being told you're made, being made redundant, for example, there are people who that doesn't matter to because they've always been considering of how to move out of that. It's not an issue. But there are people for whom, let's say, the role is a complete life, but so much other things, what's important to them depends on that. Then obviously they would have a much greater reaction to that. Mm -hmm. My only caveat to that, if you like, is that sometimes in an organisation um, we, we feel we can't react other than how people react and that's why there's often there's a lot of kind of and, and it's probably not here as much as it is in other organizations but there's a, 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 a sense that you can't be anything other than okay with change at work okay. the reality is and that kind of puts pressure on yeah. ourselves to deal to deal with things in a specific way the reality is it doesn't happen you're going to deal with it how you you're going to feel how you're going to feel mm -hmm. and that depends on the importance of the situation okay. but you're we kind of buy into the fact that you have to be okay at work. Mm -hmm. It's not okay. It's even no matter how many times people say it's okay to not be okay. The reality is, is that there's an expectation. So, okay. I suppose for people here, be conscious whether you're reacting normally, whether you're acting. Let me rephrase that. Be honest with yourselves, guys. That's it. Be honest. You don't have to tell anyone. You don't have to share it. But at least you be honest with yourselves because that's the only way that you can take your next action. Yeah, it'll catch up with you eventually. Exactly. You Sorry, big so long winded response great, to your answer. Great response. And that brings me on to my, my next question. And after this question, then I'll go to audience questions. So um, you can have something in mind. Is, it, is there such a thing as reacting badly, dangerously to change? Like having a dangerous reaction to a change? And what are maybe some of the warning signs? That the, that the person's response isn't going to be good in the long run? Well, I can't answer that, to be honest, because everybody has their own, their own reactions to things, and none of us know how we're going to react to something until it happens. Um, equally, I suppose what we have to be conscious of is our conscious steps. So the, when, we were, when I spoke about taking, the, taking control, taking responsibility of the situation, if we have consciously decided to react in a big way mm -hmm. and that decision is made with what's important to us in mind, then it doesn't matter to anyone else what that reaction is. Yeah. But if it's a reaction where we're running away from something, where we're trying to avoid it, where we're not facing up to it, then yes, that is a dangerous situation. Okay, okay. So, hey, that's great. Great, great answer. Do you have any, any live questions? I, I do a lot of work with smaller teams, so as I kind of mentioned myself, that one of the big worries, for example, when people go off maternity leave or long-term leave, even as well that the sick, is that so much happens um, while you're off. So much happens for the person, they've changed while they're off, but the, per the team has changed. So, so, so there's often a lot of um, kind of alignment to be done there, and we can do that through both training and then individual support as, as needs be. 
So are there any daily actions that we can take that would support us or help us when we do face some kind of big change? Or is there anything to be said for doing little things like taking a, a new route to work or not always having the exact same breakfast every day? Or will that help you at all? For, well, for sure it does, because that is exactly like I was talking about. That is the change perspective. If you get, if you go into on your bike ride and you got, go out into the forest without a GPS, or if I dare to drive without my own GPS, you get lost. And you get through that. And it makes you think how you would react in those dangerous or difficult situations. So yes, it is all about change. That does allow you to change perspective. The only thing we can do, look, everybody knows what works best for, 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 for them. I know mindfulness and yoga doesn't work for me. I don't enjoy them. But there are, there's so much to be said for the gratitude journals, for the, the mindfulness, for whatever works for you. Do that, but all, I suppose the bottom line to all of it is to figure out what's important to you and take action towards that. Because once you know that you can do that, no matter what life changes that throws at you, you can always adapt to that. OK, okay great. Um, you said during your talk that um, we don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. Mm -hmm. So which is it's a great line and it was eye opening for me. But it, while I was sitting there thinking, it made me realize that this it would encourage us to look back on our previous reactions to change, maybe with a kinder point of view, absolutely. Because we can be quite like, how do you find that people can be very hard on themselves and how oh, they sure. dealt with change? For sure, we we have an innate reaction to or an innate ability to um, <laughs> to look on the dark side, like never look on the positive side. We we it's it's all like personal bias and things, but we never look at what we did in the best possible light. Mm -hmm. And when you can, when you can treat yourself with the kindness that you would, without thinking, show somebody else in your life. Uh, like, it changes the whole perspective of things. I mean, I don't know, has anybody ever been in an experience where you felt that something had happened one way, and then when you spoke with somebody else about it, they saw it in a completely different light? That's the same situation. You would never, ever, ever treat another person or a person you loved the way you treat yourself in your head. Yeah. You would never do that. You wouldn't dream of it. And yet we do it all the time. So when I talk about being conscious and making those decisions, you can't stop those thoughts. And there's no point even trying. But you can challenge them. And that's one thing you can do. You can always say, hold on now a second. That's not even true. It's not true that I never get to the right place at the right time. It's yeah. just not true. I do the odd Sometimes. time, usually with Google Maps, but yeah. that's beside the point. Okay. So you know, you have to just be kind in that respect. OK, great. We've got a, got a question at the front. Great. The thing is, all you can ever do, no matter what's going on, all you can ever do is let that person know that you're there, no matter what. And, but you're there being kind, and you're there being brave, and you're there to hold her hand, metaphorically or liter literally. And that's, that's all any of us can do. There's so many things that you'd take away and you'd fix, but actually, fixing it doesn't resolve anything for the person. They're still dealing with their version of the change. They're still dealing with the things that they feel inside. And no matter what you say or do, you cannot change that. And that's what I meant when I said at the start, I can't teach you how to control change. I can't. No one can. So sorry, it's a great answer in telling you nothing. So sorry. And um, so it's just a quick follow up on that because we're getting to the close again. What are your thoughts on the, the phrase and even I chatted about this a little bit further, and I think you guys would appreciate hearing it. And the phrase, stay positive. <laughs> there Keep is your chin no up. <laughs> but I've heard that phrase once or twice. Believe you me, the bald look does nothing for me, right? So when somebody says to you, oh, you look gorgeous, be positive. It's like, oh, are you kidding me? No, I cannot bear that phrase. And, but we say it all the time. There's two ways of looking at it. The first is that it's completely, completely futile to be positive when you're feeling rubbish. If you're feeling rubbish, feel rubbish. If you're being sad or angry, be angry. God knows it'll come out somehow. But the other side of it is that, I suppose, in terms of being kind and changing your perspective, people say things. They say things because they don't have anything to say. And it's a kind of a way of trying to be there to support somebody else. It's like. 
look, this might make them feel better. I'll say this, I've heard this said, and it's a kind of a reaction. Some people feel so awkward in those situations. You know, it's, God knows, I was at a funeral there recently, and a lot of the people, when you're sympathizing, you don't know, let's say, half the family. It was like, what do you say? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then you, you have that connection with the person that you do know. You have to say something in those situations, and that's where the be positive often comes from, and it's from a, a good place. But my God, <laughs> if you find it at the tip of your tongue, just hold back. Think of another way of phrasing it. It's, it's, it if a person, encourage people, I suppose, sometimes, is that encourage people to be how they feel. If that's positive, great. If it's not, please don't ask them to be positive. <laughs> okay, great. I think we have one, uh, one final question. It's funny that mindfulness for me, and that's what I meant by the finger things, just to give you that breathing space. And that's the way I see it. So for me, I read. I, you know, sometimes when you're going to bed at night and you can't shut off. I, people who do gratitude journals and mindfulness and all that is brilliant. And it, it works really well. I, 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 don't, I don't like it. I, it makes me anxious, which defeats the purpose. But I read, and then in the reading, I can kind of switch off. It's like, you know, you can be out of your own head. And it's just to stop that craziness of thought, that tornado that can go on. That's one thing that I do. The other thing is that sometimes you just have to get on with it and just say, OK, I'll just do one thing, one thing that you can do. And even if that one thing is moving out and going and getting a cup of tea or going outside the house for a walk, just whatever that one thing is, it can be a tiniest little thing. But once you, once you feel that, that, that energy, that movement, certainly for me, that helps me feel better. It helps me kind of feel that I'm doing something. I don't feel as much of a, a victim of the situation. I'm using victim a lot, but it's probably the best word to describe sometimes how you feel in that situation. So yes, it, it helps you just do something. Great, it's a, a lovely thank question you. to close with. Thank you for asking. Thanks, for everything. Thank you for, everything. Thank you thank for you. coming into us. Thank you. Thank you very much.